indeed. People are excited about Priscilla. It is the second Sunday of our Wonder Woman series, and as you've already seen, our shero for today is Priscilla, Queen of the Deserts. <laughs> Many people asked me if I was going to talk about Priscilla, Queen of the Deserts, um, but forgive me. I may be confusing my queer culture canon with the characters from our canon of Scripture. The reality is, people of God, we tend to confuse things all the time. In fact, sometimes it's a good thing to mix one with the other. You see, we can only ever read Scripture through the lens of our own life experiences. And so it is inevitable that we will read objects of our culture into our Bible. It's not necessarily a bad thing. It can only be unhelpful and damaging when we refuse to acknowledge that it happens. And so I encourage you, if an image of a queen named Priscilla inspires you, that's exactly the name and the image you should have when you read about Priscilla in our Bible text today. If you've seen the movie Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, anyone seen it? Oh my gosh. Forgive me, I'm young, all right? Uh, <laughs> in gay years, I mean, in gay years. In the movie Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, Drag queens take their act on the road and they travel via bus. And that bus is the one that is called Priscilla. And so you see that neither Priscilla in the Bible nor the bus Priscilla, neither are real queens in the sense of royalty or an empire, so to speak. And yet people of God, they both have real power, especially in terms of how they help others find their way in life. Now, you already heard a little bit about Priscilla in the Bible. We do not know a whole lot. There are only a few mentions of her. But what we do know is that she is indeed a powerful woman. There are powerful women all amongst us. I serve and work with them, not only on staff, but the many volunteers, folks in my family, all across this city and in our world. Women are powerful. Amen? <laughs> women indeed are powerful, and Priscilla was powerful. She was respected. She was a mover and a shaker. And she helps create a narrative of the Apostle Paul that is much more inclusive than what we might have been led to believe. You see, most people think Paul is anti-woman. And they think that because of all the statements he makes, statements such as, quote, woman should remain silent and submissive in church gatherings. Boo. <laughs> Statements like, women should not have authority over a man. Boo. And we are right to boo. We read these verses from Paul's writings, and we are rightfully dismayed. And I remember when my mother was struggling to accept the idea that her only child was queer. And she spent so much time trying to wrestle with different clobber passages in the Scripture. And one day I just asked her about Paul's writings on women. Mom, what do you think of these verses that Paul writes about? And her answer was as succinct as ever. Well, I don't agree with that. <laughs> and she didn't agree with it. She didn't agree with it because her life experience and her inner relationship with God told her something different. You see, people of God, we've all got life experiences, and people have tried to project their own visions of God and images of God onto us. And the reality is, some of us, we've had some disconnects because God has been ever-present in our life for oh so long. And so when someone tries to tell us that God is not there, we have our own experience to say that is not true. God has always been with us. Life experiences are important. My mother realized that. She was a single parent, raising her only child without the need for a man in her life. She didn't need a man to submit to. She didn't need a man to tell her that she's worthy of love. And she surely wasn't going to be silent in church, let me tell you. <laughs> My mother doesn't agree with it, and I'm not convinced that the Apostle Paul really believes some of the things that he writes. You see, because like in the letter to the Romans, as we heard, one-third of all the leaders he mentions are women leaders. And whenever he mentions Priscilla, she is married, by the way, he always mentions her name first in the scriptures. Now, I don't know if you knew this, 
But that never happens in the scriptures, right? Usually the man is the one who's always referred to first, sort of deference and honor. And yet every single time Priscilla and Aquila is mentioned, Priscilla is always the first one mentioned by the Apostle Paul. Women in the early church were powerful. Like many powerful women, Priscilla in the Bible exercised her power in ways that are different than the world displays power. You see, Priscilla, instead of dominating others through dynamics of power over, of asserting power on someone else, Priscilla uses the concept of power with others. Not power over others, but power with others. People of God, power over is a concept that we are all too familiar with living in the United States of America. Power over, it permeates our world affairs, it permeates our politics, and even some of the more mundane areas of our life. And just as it permeates our world today, it permeated the biblical world as well. You see a great example of power from Priscilla in the book of Acts. And then we turn to the Gospels, and we see a different example of power. In Mark's Gospel, we see the sons of Zebedee. James and John, they're called. And let me tell you, they are in classic form, people of God. Earlier in the Gospel, Jesus calls the siblings sons of thunder, and that ain't a compliment at all. <laughs> Apparently, they caused a ruckus wherever they went. And as loud as thunder, people knew they were coming. And they feared the fires that might come about from the lightning of their thunderous presence. Whether they were the Frank and Jesse James or the Clyde and Buck Bearer of the first century, we're not exactly sure. But they might be part of Jesus' crew because of their comedic relief. They might be the Marx Brothers, if you will. You didn't think I knew that one, did you? They were quick to temper, like when in Luke's gospel, after Jesus and the disciples weren't received well in a Samaritan village, James and John, they take it a little personally, and they want to respond. And so they tell Jesus, say the word, Lord, and if you want, we'll call down fire from heaven, and we'll burn the entire place down. Now Jesus, as you might imagine, says, relax. It ain't that kind of a party. James and John were all about showing their power, and I imagine some of us have been about showing our power. Jesus knows this. He knows the Zebedee brothers can be ruthless in their reactions, and so what does Jesus do? He tries to emulate a different way for them. He begins to open up to them about how he's feeling, his own emotions, not just his hopes, but Jesus also talks about his fears. In our gospel today, right before our uh, scripture text that we have, uh, Jesus begins to open up to the disciples. He begins to tell them how the Roman authorities and the religious leaders are coming after him, so to speak. Jesus is as real with his emotions as you and I are in our moments of fear and crisis. And he tells them, they're going to arrest me, James. John, they're going to torture me, John. They're going to mock me. They're going to spit on me. They are going to try to kill me. And people of God, James and John, in the fullness of their compassion, interrupt him. Teacher, you got to do us a favor. Will you allow us to sit at your right hand and also at your left hand? The translation, if you're going to die, Jesus, can you put us in charge? We can run this kingdom. James and John have no couth, people of God, whatsoever. It's like someone telling you that uh, they have a few weeks to live and your first response is, can I have your Lexus when you're gone? <laughs> it's inappropriate, right? It's not the response you're supposed to have, and yet the sons of Zebedee have this response. And the truth is, people of God, they were playing to win against an empire called Rome that was vicious and was cruel. And they were going to try to do it the only way they knew how, and that was via power over. Now, normally we should praise James and John. Maybe they're worried about a succession plan. They're good business-minded folk. Maybe they're just being assertive, and we should applaud them for uh, exercising this great leadership. It's a power move nonetheless, but we should praise them maybe. Forget those other disciples. People of God, it's a cheap power move, but notice that Jesus does not shame them for making such bold efforts. 
He would be in his right to do so. And yet, following in the ways of Priscilla and so many other women disciples, Jesus treats them in a different way. He coaches them. He helps them find their way. And he chooses not to shame them. It would be so easy to talk to you about how we exercise power in this world, in our political sphere, right, in our uh, global sphere. And the reality is, I think we get some of that. And as progressive Christians, what we don't get is how we exercise power in our own personal lives. And sometimes the way we respond to certain situations and respond to certain uh, circumstances. Sometimes we respond in ways in which we're trying to assert power in a very unhealthy way. For example, I have worked in ministry for about 12 years now. 10 of those years have been ordained, or 11 of those years have been ordained. And I've been through many church uh, uh, ministry gatherings, many meetings where people get riled up, you know. Um, You think you have great meetings at home. I tell you, ain't nothing like a meeting at a church house. Um, I remember this one meeting, someone said something that was, I thought, what I'd call stank. And so I made it my business to shame them in front of everyone, to call them out for what they said because it was wrong and everybody knew it was wrong. And yet I still wanted to say something and so I said it, people of God. And do you know what I felt? I felt so good. Do you know what it feels like when you put someone else in their place? When someone's mistreating other people and you put them in their place, it feels real good. And you know what? No one was changed in that meeting. Me choosing to shame someone else in a ministry meeting where we're supposed to love one another and coach one another. Nothing happened. No transformation occurred. It was a simple giving out and letting out of emotion so I can assert power and we could hold power in those meetings. People of God, it's not just me. We all do this. You don't have to be at a church boardroom or at your business office. At your kitchen table, we do the same kinds of meetings trying to outdo one or the other, right? Trying to win the game with our partners. What's the game? It's life. And yet Priscilla, Jesus, ways in the gospel, they show us a different way to act in our world. And it's not just how we treat one another, it's also how we treat ourselves. You want to talk about power. Many of us are, we choose to hold on to positions in our world because of power. Many of us choose to hold on to our positions in our relationships because of power. For many years, I was in a relationship, a long-term relationship. It was the first love of my life. Oh, he was beautiful, people of God. (laughs) Gorgeous, right? And then something happened. We just didn't gel anymore, right? I tell you, for many years, I stopped believing in the devil until I dated him. And the reality is, years ago, it was time for us to move on. And so we had a breakup, and it was ugly. Now, you know an ugly breakup where you just don't part ways, but you, you go on Facebook and you, you put something in there, right? You share a photo or you say something real stank so everybody can see it. You want to shame others, right? That's how we were in pub- public, and yet in private, in private, we were torn up on the inside of ourselves. We really hurt one another, but we were hurting ourselves. And so we finally, we decided to part ways. And it was the best thing that could ever happen to us in our life. And yet doing it was so tough, right? Because you're in this relationship and people see you in this relationship and there's power in that relationship. And all I could think to myself was, oh, how are people going to perceive us now? If this pastor can't uphold a healthy relationship in his life, how are they going to uphold a healthy relationship in their lives? Yes, we could have stayed together, but I kept thinking to myself, six years of my life just thrown away with this person. Would I ever love again? I don't want to be alone. But the truth was, it was best for us to be apart. And thank God we were able to rely on God's grace to move on with our lives. Now, my ex-partner is married now, and that's a miracle. (laughs) And another miracle, I have found a loving partner, and it only took five years and 20 boyfriends to find him. 
but a miracle nonetheless. And people of God, there are other ways we hold on to power in our lives. You see, Priscilla, in our gospel, or in our Acts reading, which is gospel for us today, she could have shamed Apollos in front of everybody. She had the right tools, the skills. She could have done it. And yet she waits until the end and pulls him aside just so he could be a bit more accurate in his teaching. Jesus says we are to be a servant of all. And the Greek word is doulos. Doulos means slave and also a servant in the ancient times. Today, there are doulas in our midst. A few years ago, I worked with doulas in school. And if you're not familiar with doulas, doulas are, um, it's a word that means women who serve. And we most notably know them from uh, birth doulas. You got to thank people of God. We live in a really highly advanced medical field and a healthcare system. And yet for many folks who become pregnant, it can be a very daunting circumstance. All the questions you have and some questions you don't want to ask because of how others might perceive you in your life. You're supposed to be a good mother. You're supposed to know this already. And yet there are far too many of us who don't know this and we don't have systems in place to really take care of folks. Well, thank God there's an ancient concept, an ancient group called doulas who have been brought back to life over the last few years. And their focus isn't necessarily on prescribing meds. What doulas do is they help women who are pregnant just be a listening ear and they provide coaching advice, right? And so when a woman needs to uh, say something or express her fears or ask any sort of questions that you can't ask your partner, so to speak, you talk to the doula. And once you know they're just chatting with somebody, having someone there to listen to you can create a transformational impact on your life. It is said that uh, women who use doulas uh, throughout their pregnancy are about 30 to 40 percent less likely to have uh, complications during their pregnancy. They're also less likely to ask for more meds and epidural during their, uh, when it's time to give labor. But even more than that, they're confident. They're able to wrestle with this gift of life within them like never before, just because there are doulas, servants of all in their midst. There are many different types of doulas, birth doulas, death doulas as well. People who are, uh, have terminal illnesses sometimes seek out a death doula, someone to talk to. I think we should all be doulas in our life. It's what we're supposed to be called to do, right? To be Priscilla and be Wonder Woman in our world. To be a listening ear for others, to coach them, to not shame them, but also to be willing to be coached by others in our life. I firmly believe that just as our lives have been in fact impacted by the many women amongst us, the women in our midst, just as there are examples of many healthy women relationships in our scriptures, especially as it relates to power with as opposed to power over, the responsibility is now with us. If you want to be a Wonder Woman, you need to share power. And if you're going to share power, listen to your neighbor, love your neighbor, coach your neighbor, and let God create miracles in our midst. May it be so in Christ's name. Amen.